Uh, a long time ago, I actually did use uh, some motion capture software in my, in, my, in my fitting sessions, mainly because I was kind of offered it. I was offered to test it for a while. And I gave it a good run for a, oh, probably two months or so. And in the end, I basically just moved away from it because it wasn't helping at all. So in my, in my mind, the angle at which your knee extends, for example, let's take one element of the kinetic chain, the one that most people can kind of reconcile and imagine and, and visualize the best, which is the knee angle extension at the bottom of the stroke. So they will come up with an angle which might be like 128 degrees to 132 degrees or something. And your knee has to open at the bottom of the stroke to that exact angle. And once it's in that angle, that's it. That's your seat height, right? They also will take things like like an, like a, an ankle angle range, um, so that across the, the ankle joint, they'll measure your ankling and that kind of stuff. They'll measure the hips, uh, you know, closure angle, that kind of stuff. These things basically have no no relevance to the numbers that you derive from them. I should say have no relevance to biomechanical normality amongst or variability is a better word to use amongst people. So I've got, for example, I'm an excellent example of this. And uh, uh, so my, my, my seat height, if you watch me ride from the side at low levels of load, my knee closure angle is unbelievably low. You'll also see it riding, you'll actually see this a lot in the pro peloton. I was watching some footage of, uh, of, of a bunch of uh, pros going up a big climb the other day and noticed just that a lot of their seats look a lot lower than you would expect. And it's because they've gravitated that way over the years because it, it feels better and they're more stable, right? This angle in me is extremely deep. My knee, my knee loses control at the bottom of the stroke, which is the way that I set seat heights, is looking for control of the pedal stroke. My knee loses control at a very deep angle, right? So if I go a little bit higher than that, I, I go way out of shape, my left knee hurts and so forth. So if I had a a motion capture system look at me, they, they generally tend to set my seat height about 30 millimetres higher than what I set it at. And that gives me pretty much instantaneous left knee pain. It makes me twist to the bike, it makes me favour my dominant leg, and I go out of shape and I, I feel terrible. So I'm, a, I'm kind of a slight one end of the bell curve, I'm a little bit unusual in that sense, but the group of people that's outside these angles is so large that it's basically not worth measuring the angle. What you need to look for is control of the pedal stroke. So the angle is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is how much control you have over the stroke. This is just one element of, of, of the kinetic chain that they're measuring. Similarly, the ankling that they display at the bottom of the stroke, which is another thing that they will measure, there's some kind of an angle that they recommend that you have. But I'm a massive heel dropper. I drop my heels no matter what I do, right? So I ride very flat footed. My foot is almost horizontal to the ground. I am way outside the normal parameters. Some people tow the pedal really aggressively. This angle is irrelevant. It is only, the only thing you need to know is that that is the person's natural pedal stroke, right? So we're not, we're trying to not force them to do something which puts them in the middle of a bell curve. We're just trying to adapt the position around their body. And yeah, I'm a, a fantastic example because I'm very, very odd with the way that I ride. And I've got riders that can only ride with the seat much, much higher than that. It's the only way they don't have pain. So, you know, the angle measurements are a bit iffy at best. Not only that, they tend to be, they tend to be derived from, they, they're derived, as far as I know, from averages, right? So what they do is they get 100 riders or 200 riders or whatever, and they come up with a bunch of seat heights, and then they average it. And they go, all right, well, this is the angle that everyone should be in. And that, there's a number of problems with that. One of them is, if you're like me and you're outside the average, it's way off in some people. The other thing is that that assumes, for example, with the knee angle, if we're talking about the knee angle, that assumes that all of those riders' seat heights were perfect when they measured the angle. And maybe they were too high, but they didn't know. Maybe they were too low, but they didn't know. You just don't know. So averaging these things and trying to apply them with broad brush strokes across large sample sizes of the population is a bit of a problem. There's also the, the, the classic, one of the other classic ones that I love to talk about is, is the included shoulder angle. They have one where they measure the angle of the shoulder here to the torso. And that one is so comical because they aim for, I think they aim for 90 degrees most of the fitting systems. It's so hilarious because some, like you, if, imagine if we've got this bike, for example, behind me here. If we put, a, if we put the bar up um, five centimetres and we also lengthened the stem five centimetres, so the whole bar moves out in a 45 degree arc like this, the angle at the shoulder would pretty much stay the same. So the person's torso would sit more upright. This would stay much the same 
and the angle would still be within the parameters that the fitting system is happy with. Or we can lower the bars 50 millimeters, move them 50 millimeters closer to you, and the angle will kind of still be the same. So <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of suppositions in that angle measurement, which you just, you just don't want to rely on that stuff. Now, the idea behind the, the motion capture software systems is, a, is an admirable one. What they're trying to do, apart from make money and, and, and standardise this, is they're trying to standardise the system so that you can sell the system to people all over the globe and with minimal training, they can then be a bike fitter. They can call themselves a, 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 a professional bike fitter. So this is, this is admirable. They're trying to standardise something, which is bike positioning, which is unfortunately impossible to standardise. You just can't do it, which is why I think I'll probably always have a job <laughs> because there's just, there's so many, so many difficulties in standardising this that I gave up trying to standardise it a long time ago. The only thing you can do is, is, is treat the individual as an individual. So trying to standardise things by, by, by coming up with joint angles is, is a, it's a real big problem. Um, to add yet another problem to the, the plethora of problems with the systems that I see, where the person places the dots, that's a real simple one. If you, for example, one of the classic ones is they, they try and um, put a, one of the little infrared dots on your greater trochanter, which is the, 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 the kind of neck of the end of the neck of the femur, which is not really the pivot point of the hip, which is actually deep inside the socket, but it's where, this, where the bone comes out here with your femur to the outside of the hip. That point is highly variable. You can't palpate it easily in a lot of people. If you put the thing three mil too far forward, it changes the joint closure angle by two degrees, which means that the seat might move back three millimeters or five millimeters because you've put the dot in the wrong place. <laughs> so that, that alone brings in another element of difficulty with the systems. You know, replicatability of the dot placement is a big problem. It's a huge problem. It's, a, it's an insurmountable problem. Unless you happen to be able to um, see within the person's body with your x-ray vision and place them in exactly the right spot. And then if the, if you, if the person comes back for a, another check for a, a new bike, for example, you need to be able to put them in exactly the same spot, that kind of thing. So yeah, it, it is a bit of a problem. I've found that there's, there's no substitute for experience with these sorts of things. Um, just a good pair of eyes. A, a, a person who knows what they're doing with bike positioning can look at a rider and say, your seat is too far forward and it's too high and the bars are too high and too short or something. The, once you've seen a thousand people ride a thousand bikes, it becomes easier to spot problems. But there's just no substitute for that kind of experience, um, which is why most bike fitters are rubbish in the first couple of years of their careers, as I was. The stuff that I've the, the, the level that I operate at now is much better than what I did before. Just like a car mechanic, just like a dentist, just like a doctor, just like anyone. You get better at the job the longer you do it. The motion capture software systems, I find, they tend to spit out an unreliably difficult position for a lot of people because they're based off spurious measurements which are poorly taken and they don't have their basis in, in, in biomechanical reality for, for the riders. Occasionally, however, you will find a person operating one of these systems who looks at the position and goes, right, this is all within the angles that we want, but you look like you're too high or too far forward. So we're just going to move it back and deviate from the recommendations. That's great. If the, if the person, and if, assuming that they're doing this well, if they can deviate from the recommendations by using good judgment, happy days. That's a step, step that they're moving the right way. They're using their own judgment. And assuming that their judgment is good, and in my experience with, a, with a, a, a fitter who's been working for quite a few years, their judgment will be better than the software's judgment. Yeah. So I guess my gripes are that they're trying to standardise something that, that just can't be standardised. There's a lot of intra-tester unreliability, we call it, um, from the placement of the dots and all that kind of stuff. And just to throw another one at you, none of them take into account or have any as far as I've ever seen in my, in my career dealing with the, the flow on consequences of, of poor quality fitting systems, none of them deal with asymmetry. So if you've got one knee that's chopping across the line of the pedal or you're twisted to the bike, they can't help you. 
No, it's just this is an element of complexity in the fitting process which is beyond most of the fitting systems, yeah. You may find a very talented bike fitter who knows what they're doing, but the software ain't helping them to, to resolve that asymmetry in that rider. So, and that's, you know, that's, that's, I, I believe that's pretty much the only really complex part of bike fitting is getting rid of asymmetry. The rest of it's pretty straightforward, but yeah, getting a person to sit square to the bike and evenly extend both legs in a symmetrical fashion, that's the hardest part of all and they just don't deal with that stuff much. So yeah, that's enough of me whinging about, uh, <laughs> about software-based fitting systems. It is just something that I've gravitated away from over the years because it just doesn't work very well, you know. <laughs>